Thank you very much. Can we have the slides on, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm often asked, are there any special perspectives which astronomers can offer to science and philosophy? And I think there are. An awareness of the immense future lying ahead. Let me explain. The huge time spans of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture. Darwinism tells us that we and our biosphere are the outcome of about four billion years of natural selection. But most people still somehow think that we humans are the culmination. And that hardly seems credible to an astronomer. Indeed, we know that we may be nearer the beginning than the end of evolution because that future ch time chart reminds us that our sun formed four and, a, four and a half billion years ago, but it's got another six billion years before the fuel runs out and it flares up engulfing the inner planets. And the expanding universe will continue far longer, indeed, perhaps forever. So this tells us that any creatures witnessing the sun's demise six billion years hence and sending this postcard won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug. In fact, Darwin himself realized that not one living species will transmit its unaltered likeness to the distant future. But even in this perspective, stretching billions of years, millions of centuries indeed into the future, as well as into the past, this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, is so dominant, so empowered, that it has the Earth's future in its hands. We've entered what Paul Kreutzen called the Anthropocene. But relevant to my comments now, this century is also the first when our species can expand beyond its home planet. But let's start with some history. Here's Isaac Newton, and he must have thought about space travel. He imagined cannonballs being fired from a mountain top, and he calculated that to go into a circular orbit, it would have to go at 25,000 kilometers per hour. That was, of course, far beyond uh, what could be done at the time, and it wasn't until 1957 that the first Sputnik went up into orbit, followed by some dogs, and then by Gagarin four years later. And a decade after that, we had this picture, iconic for environmentalists, taken by Apollo astronauts orbiting the moon. And then we had Neil Armstrong's One Small Step, and I cherish this picture, signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. These were, of course, excitingly futuristic exploits for most of us who are middle-aged and here today, but today, today's young people, their ancient history, long before they were born, because the momentum of Apollo program wasn't maintained. Had it been, there would be footprints on Mars by now, but the political motive lapsed once the Russians had been beaten to them in the moon race. NASA now receives 0.6% of the US federal budget, whereas in the Apollo period, it received 4%. In the decades since then, humans have been into orbit, many hundreds of them, but only into low Earth orbit, mainly in this International Space Station. But space technology, of course, is burgeoned. We depend on it every day for communications, sat-nav, and environmental monitoring. And astronomy has benefited hugely from space telescopes, as we'll hear this afternoon, um, and unmanned probes to other planets have been back pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. Uh, last year, we had the uh, ESA uh, probe that went to the comet Rosetta, uh, the Rosetta probe, and it landed a little uh, robot on the surface of the comet. And we also had NASA's New Horizon, which went to Pluto and beamed back these pictures. Here's one of Pluto, there's one of Pluto and its moon, Charon. These pictures come from 10,000 times further away than the moon. And it is really extraordinary that this is 1990s technology, because these uh, uh, probes going to the comet and to Pluto took 10 years on their journey, five years in the planning, and just think how much 
smartphones have changed and how much better we can do today. And indeed, uh, we can expect that during this century, the whole solar system will be explored by flotillas of miniaturized probes, far more advanced than we could do today. And I think later this century, we'll have big robotic fabricators building vast lightweight structures floating in space. Gossamer thin radio reflectors, or maybe solar energy collectors. And they will perhaps be mining material from the asteroids, and Guy in the next talk will be saying a bit more about that. Well, what about people? This is um, Harrison Schmidt, one of the last two men on the moon, uh, and he was a geologist. We now have on Mars this Curiosity probe, which has been uh, trundling across a huge Martian crater, uh, trying to observe the geology. And of course, a real geologist like Harrison Schmidt would find things that this probe will miss. But robots are closing the gap. As they advance, the practical case for human space flight is going to get weaker. Human beings cost a great deal more to send into space, and they won't be much better than future robots. Nonetheless, many of us hope that people will venture into deep space, though it won't be for practical reasons, it'll be as adventurers rather than for practical goals. Incidentally, if China wanted to mount a prestige project, they could go to Mars within 20 years. And they might choose to do this. But if they don't, the enterprise of human exploration will be left to, I think, private enterprise efforts. That's because these can tolerate higher risks than a Western government could impose on publicly funded civilians. And thereby, the private companies can do much cheaper projects compared to NASA or ESA. And the most promising developments are spearheaded by these private companies in the US at the moment. SpaceX, which is led by Elon Musk, who also makes Tesla electric cars, hopes soon to, orbital, to offer orbital flights to paying customers. And one step beyond that, wealthy adventurers are signing up for a week-long trip round the far side of the moon voyaging further from Earth than anyone has been before. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight, so maybe that's uh, slightly ominous. But these exploits should be promoted as adventures or extreme sports. The phrase space tourism should be avoided because that lulls people into unrealistic confidence. But by 2100, the end of this century, Courageous pioneers in the mold of round-the-world balloonists or polar explorers may have established bases independent from the Earth, maybe on Mars. Mars himself, who's 45, sorry, Musk himself, who's 45 years old, says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> um, and he might. I'm skeptical, though, about his plan announced just last month for a rapid build-up of the Martian population to a million plus. That's because no way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. There's no planet B. We've got to stick with our Earth. Indeed, space is an inherently hostile environment for humans. And for that reason, even though genetic and cyborg technology, which is advancing fast, will no doubt be regulated here on Earth for ethical and prudential reasons, we should surely wish these intrepid space pioneers far beyond the range of earthly regulations good luck in using all such techniques to adapt to alien conditions. And they will quickly, actually, uh, evolve into a new species because they will be able to use these techniques to transform their progeny into entities quite better adapted to the external uh, environment away from the Earth. And indeed, the post-human era will begin away from the Earth, not on it. 
because there's a stronger motiva motivation for uh, uh, modifying uh, by genetic techniques and by cyborg techniques um, uh, away from the Earth than on it. And, of course, these changes could be far faster than Darwinian evolution on the timescale of technological advance, not that of natural selection. So, post-human evolution would proceed, not on the Earth, but spearheaded by pioneers and adventurers away from the Earth. And out there, eventually, the machines may take over. They may take over because there are limits to the capacity of organic wet brains. We may be near these limits. I don't know. But these could be far transcended by electronic or even quantum computers. In the grand time chart of cosmic history, the few millennia of organic human-like intelligence could be just a thin transitional sliver which would be followed by a vastly longer period of electronic intelligences. And they won't need to be on the planet. They may prefer zero G, so if they won't even stay on Mars, be able to spread far further. This raises the other question, which we'll hear about from Lisa Kaltenegger this afternoon. Is there life out there already? We know there are no Martians. Indeed, there's no way in our solar system that harbors advanced life, though there may be freeze-dried bacteria on Mars, there may be creatures swimming under the ice on Jupiter's moon Europa or Saturn's moon Enceladus. But the hottest current topic in astronomy is the realization that many other stars, perhaps even most, are orbited by retinues of planets. And we'll hear from Laser this afternoon about these. But is there life on any of those planets? Here we don't know because we don't understand the likelihood of life evolving. We don't understand how on Earth uh, the uh, transition from complex biochemistry to the first metabolizing, reproducing systems happened. We don't know if it was a rare fluke or if it would happen elsewhere. And moreover, even if simple life were common, we don't know how likely it is that it would evolve into anything that was intelligent. But there are now more serious searches for evidence of intelligence life, evidence of transmissions which are narrow band or pulsed in a way that can't arise naturally, or to look also for some non-natural artifacts that would indicate that there was some intelligence out there already. We don't know the odds of finding anything, but if we don't search, the odds will be zero. And we may feel that even if success is unlikely, it's worth some effort and some wealthy private enthusiasts, most recently a Russian billionaire called Yuri Milner, are bankrolling such efforts. And I think it's good that he's spending his money this way, not on a yacht or a football team, which some other <laughs> Russians do. And the searches, um, the Breakthrough Lishan Initiative, are going to look at many stars and many galaxies uh, using uh, large telescopes. And they're going to look in the radio and also in the optical. Well, perhaps the cosmos teams with life. Maybe there's even a galactic club out there which we want to they join as junior members. The senior members may, for reasons I've just explained, be electronic rather than organic. On the other hand, our Earth could be unique among the billions of planets that surely exist. That would be depressing for the searchers, but it would allow us to be less cosmically modest because it would mean that the Earth, though tiny, could be the most complex and interesting entity in the entire galaxy, whose future would then matter not just to us, hum us humans, but to affect uh, the wider cosmos. So, before embarking on further speculations, I've run out of time, uh, so let me stop here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.